I'm Lou Dean, your host, and on behalf of the Virginia Satellite Education Network, I want to welcome you to the Science Museum of Virginia and our special live broadcast, The Great Dinosaur Mystery. We're going to invite you to join us in looking at the mysteries that dinosaurs have left, and then we're going on a search for some of the answers. And I say that you will join us because you'll have a chance to call in by telephone with your questions for our scientists later in the program. Now, many of you have seen last month's broadcast, Walking with the Dinosaurs, on the Virginia Satellite Education Network. And at that time, you were taken live to a quarry right here in Virginia, near Culpeper, where thousands of footprints of some of the very early dinosaurs have been found. You saw at that time how fossils are made, and you found out about the dinosaurs that lived at that time right here in what is present-day Virginia. Now, today, we're going to look at these mysteries. How the dinosaurs moved. Yeah, they were large. They were lumbering. How did they get around? How they lived. Did they live in a community? Did they live alone? Did they communicate? Did they take care of their young? Were they good parents? How smart were they? How did the dinosaurs change? You know, they lived for so many millions of years, 150 million years or so, and there were thousands of kinds of dinosaurs. Many died out long before the last dinosaur died out. How did these changes happen? And then we'll look into how they died. In the end, as you know, all the dinosaurs died out. We have uh, my friend here today. What do we think caused that extinction? Well, we're fortunate to have here at the Science Museum a set of moving models of some of the later dinosaurs made by Dynamation Corporation. Now, this is a full-scale moving model of Tyrannosaurus rex. Now, this guy was built for speed. Before we go any further, let me introduce the scientists who will be taking part uh, and talking with you today. First of all, on the phone, all the way from California, 3,000 miles away, is Dr. George Callison with Dynamation. And he helped design all of the models that were here at the Science Museum, including my friend T-Rex. Uh, George, Dr. Callison, are you on the phone? Can you hear me? OK, George, uh, please tell us how large the, uh, the real full-scale Tyrannosaurus rex is. And how fast could he go? Thank you, Dr. Callison. We'll be back with you with questions a little bit uh, later in our program. Now, from the U.S. Geological Survey, we have Dr. Ron Litwin, who will be telling us about the way dinosaurs lived. We want to thank you for joining us, Dr. Litwin. Also, from the U.S. Geological Survey, we have Dr. Robert Williams. No, well, we don't have a question for them. So can you pick them up? What? Yeah. Let me go back one. Sure. All right, uh, I'm talking to George Callison right now, and George is very kind to answer these questions on the phone. Thank you, Dr. Callison, and we'll be back with you in uh, just a moment. From the U.S. Geological Survey, we have Dr. Ron Litwin, who will be telling us about the way dinosaurs lived. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Litwin. Now, also from the U.S. Geological Survey, we have Dr. Robert Weems. Welcome, Dr. Weems. And Ken Wilson, an, ast uh, an astronomer and director of the Ethel Universe Planetarium here at the Science Museum of Virginia. He'll talk to us about extinction theories. Welcome, Ken. From Godwin High School in nearby Henrico County, we have science teacher Joanne Mulvaney and some of her students from Godwin High School who will be participating by asking questions a little bit later in the program. Welcome, Joanne, and I want to thank all of you for joining us today. Remember that those of you who have a telephone in your classroom will also be able to call in your questions to us. So as you're watching the first part of our program, be thinking of the uh, questions as you watch. Let me, uh, uh, let me talk to George Callison. If you're still on the phone from California, let's see if we can reach him here. Do we? George, are you really with us? George, I need a yes or a no, first of all. I can't hear him either. I won't be able to hear that all the way over there.
I can hear him. Can we do that? Is it possible to get him on the IFB? All right. George Callison, can you hear me? This is Lou Dean in Richmond. I heard an okay. I'm looking for the ancient parent. have a plan C. Yeah, I have less than four minutes to air. I have three minutes to air now. Are we ready with Dr. Litwin? Are you going to ask a question? Yes. Uh, Dr. Litwin, tell us how dinosaurs lived. Well, dinosaurs filled almost all of the ecological niches that modern animals do today, except for perhaps burrowing, flying, or swimming. Uh, we have a tape here explaining and showing some of the dinosaurs in action, so perhaps we'd like to take a look at that right now. Great. Hi, I'm George Callison. I'm a paleontologist. I love to discover fossils. I like to look at fossils and practice. Yeah. All right. And now we have Dr. Weems. Uh, can you tell us something about the, uh, the evolution of the dinosaurs, how they changed over the years? OK, well, dinosaurs were on Earth for a very long time, and they changed considerably from the earliest ones to the later ones. And we have a tape that'll show some of the changes that they underwent during the our evolution. Will that do it? That's excellent. And Ken, you have this rock in your hand. What are you doing with this rock? Well, Lou, this piece of space rock may well be a relative of the one that uh, did in the dinosaurs. Oh, I see. I'm sorry. Keep speaking? Yeah. That's fine. Yes, yeah, so I can get in, right. But you're going to pass in front of me, right? I will pass in front of me, and then you can step behind me. Right. Okay. And now from Godwin High School in my neighborhood, I'm right behind you. We have Joanne Mulvaney, who teaches science out there. And uh, what can we learn about the, uh, the fossils that we find? And well, we hope that our students are able to glean from studying the fossils the processes that are involved in doing science. Do you want her looking at me or at the camera or what? Okay, that's you doing fine. At, fine. At him, right? Okay. And that's... Okay. What do we do about uh, Dr. Callison? What do I do? Do I refer to him? Should I... What do we do about the first videotape? Right. That's fine. Mm -hmm.
good morning. I'm Lou Dean, your host. And on behalf of the Virginia Satellite Education Network, I want to welcome you to the Science Museum of Virginia and our special live broadcast talking about the great dinosaur mystery. We're going to invite you to join us in looking at the mysteries that the dinosaurs have left behind. And then you and my friends here will go on a search for some answers. I say you will join us because you'll have a chance to call in by telephone with questions for our scientists who are here today. That'll be a little later in the program. Now, many of you may have seen last month's broadcast called Walking with the Dinosaurs. That also was on the Virginia Satellite Education Network. You were taken live to a quarry right here in Virginia, near Culpeper, yes. where thousands of footprints of some of the early dinosaurs were found. And you saw at that time how fossils were made, and you found out about the dinosaurs that lived at that time right here in Virginia. Now today, there are several mysteries that we're going to look into. How did the dinosaurs move? They were big, lumbering creatures. How did they get around? We're going to find out how they lived. Did they live in a community? Or did they live alone? Did they communicate? Did they take care of their young? What kind of parents were they? How smart were they? We'll also find out how they changed. You know, they lived for so many millions of years, something like 150 million years. Many died out long before the final dinosaur died out. How did these changes happen? And then we'll find out how they died. In the end, of course, all the dinosaurs are gone, except perhaps my friend here, and he's, he's just a model. What do we think caused that extinction? We're fortunate to have here at the Science Museum a set of moving models of some of the later di late dinosaurs made by the Dynamation International Corporation. Now, this is a full-scale model of Tyrannosaurus rex. He was built for speed. He was built for hunting. And before we go any further, let me introduce to you some of the uh, scientists who will be with us. From uh, California, Dr. George Callison, uh, who uh, is with Dynamation. And Dr. Callison, can you hear me? Okay. All right. Which we also have... All right, we do hear him. Uh, Dr. Callison will be with us uh, by telephone. We hope to have him... Uh, tell us a little bit about the dinosaurs as we go on in this program. Also with us from the U.S. Geological Survey, we have Dr. Ron Litlin, who will be telling us about the way dinosaurs lived. Also from the U.S. Geological Survey, we have Dr. Robert Weems. Dr. Weems will be explaining some things about how the dinosaurs changed over the years. And Ken Wilson, an astronomer and director of the Ethel Universe Planetarium, here at the Science Museum of Virginia. He joins us to talk about extinction theories. Also from Godwin High School in nearby Henrico County, we have a science teacher, Joanne Mulvaney, and Joanne brings with us some of her students from Godwin High School, who will be participating by asking questions a little bit later in the program, just as you can do that. Welcome, Joanne, and I want to thank all of you for joining us. Remember that those of you in your classroom who have a telephone can call in with your questions a little bit later in the program. So as you watch what we're doing in this first part of the program, please be thinking of the questions that you will want to call in and ask. Now, uh, first of all, to uh, Dr. Callison, I uh, want to make sure he's either on the line or not. Again, we're talking to him in California, some 3,000 miles away. George, are you with us? I can't hear you, but George is one of the folks responsible, Dr. Callison, one of the folks responsible for this huge model here. And we want to show you just a little bit about these creatures and how these models were made. Hi, I'm George Callison. I'm a paleontologist. I love to discover fossils. I like to look at fossils and practically everything else. I like to study them carefully, and try to figure out what's happening. Let's look at a dinosaur. Any dinosaur will do. What do you see? They stand up like mammals, such as elephants and rhinos. And they stand up like birds, like ostriches, turkeys, and chickens. Legs are one of the main features that make dinosaurs special. They stand up. They don't sprawl on the ground like lizards and alligators, the regular reptiles. Just what are the consequences of standing up? 
Well, gravity can get you. It's easy to fall down. It's hard work to stand up. It takes energy. The energy is used to make muscles contract and hold the body up. Muscle contraction generates heat. Dinosaurs make heat just by standing around. When dinosaurs move, they make even more heat. Heat warms the inside of their bodies. Makes their blood warm, too. Because of this, I think big dinosaurs were warm-blooded. Not exactly like you and I are warm-blooded, nor exactly like other mammals and birds are warm-blooded, but some sort of warm-bloodedness. This is a mystery about dinosaurs. What were their insides like? What do you think you would need to know in order to be convinced that dinosaurs were warm-blooded? Biological scientists called physiologists study how animals make and use heat within their bodies. Another consequence of standing up is that it's easy to move. All you have to do is to relax the right muscles and you begin to fall. Your inner ear tells you that you are falling and your brain tells your leg muscles to step out to keep from falling. And wow, you're moving. You're off and running without hardly trying. Fossil footprints of dinosaurs tell us how they walked and ran. Can you tell how fast you were running by looking at your footprints? Dinosaurs were wonderful walkers and the very best runners of their time. Well, what makes a good runner? Have you ever tried to catch a chicken? They're really fast. They have many qualities of a good runner, just as dinosaurs had. Good runners have powerful leg-moving muscles, their thighs and their drumsticks. They have long legs and skinny feet. Muscles move legs back and forth like pendulums. The faster you move them, the faster you run. Why are legs of good running animals big at the top and slender at the feet? It's a principle of physics that makes it easy to run fast. To understand how this works, think of a sledgehammer. It's big and heavy on one end and long and skinny on the other. It's hard to move the hammer fast unless you do it backwards. That is, you hold onto the heavy head and move the handle. When you move it this way, the hammer is like a leg. Experiment with a hammer yourself. You'll discover that you can make it move faster and have more endurance doing it when you hold the head and move the handle, rather than using a hammer as a hammer. Running speed is expressed mathematically as the length of stride times the rate of stride. The fastest animals have long and rapid strides. When feet are heavy, animals can't move them fast. Also, by making the lower leg and the foot skinny, the leg can be made longer. Among living animals, giraffes emphasize long strides, but pigs emphasize rapid strides. Cheetahs and antelopes, the fastest runners of all, emphasize both. The dinosaurs, Parasaurolophus, Pachycephalosaurus, Allosaurus, and Tyrannosaurus, emphasized long and rapid strides. They were probably pretty fast runners, maybe 30 miles an hour. Triceratops probably emphasized rapid strides too. They were probably fast as well. Apatosaurus and Stegosaurus had heavy feet and relatively short legs. They probably weren't able to run much more than 10 miles an hour. Because of their upright stance and slender feet, we think that most dinosaurs were rapid runners and generally quite active animals. Speaking of being active, I think I'm going to run over to the lunchroom and have some fried chicken so I can review my biology, paleontology, and physics. And don't forget, look carefully at everything and always be curious about nature. It's the exciting way to learn. Dr. George Callison is with Dynamation, the group that built these animated dinosaurs, and as you can tell, he had to do quite a bit of research before he could build accurate models for today. With us now is Dr. Ron Litwin with the U.S. Geological Survey. Thank Dr. You. Litwin, how did the dinosaurs live? How smart were they? Well, from all we can tell now, the dinosaurs probably were as smart as some of the hawks and eagles are today, and that also they were very successful because they inhabited almost every ecological niche that we have for mammals today, except for flying, for swimming, and perhaps for burrowing. So they were very successful. Were they, were they smart? Yes, I think if, if you would call a hawk or an eagle smart or an ostrich, uh -huh. then they probably had about that, probably had that capacity for intelligence and for complex behavior. 
So, and we also have a tape uh, that shows some of these questions and uh, give you a little bit more um, information for the, to uh, generate some more questions. Let's have a look at that now. Clues left in the fossil bones, teeth, and footprints of dinosaurs help us to reconstruct them as real living animals. Several major questions about dinosaurs can be answered by fossil evidence. What did live dinosaurs look like? What kind of social structure or interaction did they have? And what kind of parents were they? What they look like in life can be answered only partially. For example, fossils have not yet told us what the color of dinosaurs were. We can only make intelligent approximations of their color by looking at the color patterns of living reptiles. Several partially mummified dinosaurs have been found, which do give us evidence that several of the duck-billed dinosaurs and large carnivorous dinosaurs had scaly skin similar to that of modern alligators. Most researchers accept that other dinosaurs had similar leathery skin. Recently, a few researchers have proposed that small carnivorous dinosaurs may have had feathers like birds to keep them warm. Dinosaur social behavior can be inferred from dinosaur footprints and trackways left in the mud millions of years ago and now turned to rock. Trackways around the world provide evidence that many plant-eating dinosaurs probably lived and moved about in herds. Some sauropods, like Apatosaurus, appear to have kept their smaller and younger individuals nearer to the center of their herds as they traveled, presumably for protection. The earliest evidence of paired behavior among meat-eating dinosaurs comes from Lake Triassic track site near Culpeper, Virginia. Indirect evidence of social behavior also can be inferred from dinosaur skeletal remains. Triceratops, for example, was heavily armored on its head and neck, but relatively unarmored along its flanks and hindquarters. These animals may have lived in herds that formed an outward-facing circle when threatened, much as musk oxen in the Arctic do today. Skeletal remains from Pachycephalosaurus, for example, the thick bony dome on top of the skull and the complex neck vertebra, indicate that these animals may have butted each other with their heads much as bighorn sheep do today. Because these knobs were blunt rather than spear-like, they probably were used in settling disputes over territory or mates without injuring each other. Some recent evidence also suggests that several types of dinosaurs were caregiving parents. Dinosaur nests recently discovered in Montana indicate two different nesting behaviors in two species of plant-eating dinosaurs. In one case, Broken but largely intact fossil egg shells in a nest suggest that the babies left their nest soon after hatching. In the second case, the egg shells were more completely crushed and packed together at the bottom of the nest. These infant dinosaurs probably lived in their nest for some time after hatching, suggesting that one or both of their parents fed and cared for their infants. Many people assume that dinosaurs were giant, lumbering, and dumb bees. It is true that many of them were giants. However, evidence seen in, fo in fossil trackways shows that many dinosaurs were two-footed, walked and ran efficiently, and were capable of moderately complex behavior. Similarly, evidence of nest building and perennial care in plant-eating dinosaurs, as well as footprint evidence suggesting sophisticated group behavior, indicate that dinosaurs were not stupid, but probably were about as intelligent as modern predatory birds. Dr. Littman, we've found out an awful, we've inferred an awful lot about dinosaurs in, uh, here in 1992, looking back 150 million years. That's right. But as, uh, as scientists, you and the others, look at dinosaurs, what are the, the most perplexing questions that are still facing you? Well, there are several. One of them, very uh, certainly, is with as successful as these beasts are and as large-bodied as they are, um, why are they all gone? They have filled most of the niches that the mammals do, and the mammals, in fact, started to evolve at about the same time as the dinosaurs. But for 150 million years ago, these were the main players on the stage. Uh, why are they gone now? And also, what was their social behavior like? There are a lot of things that we can't tell from the fossils. Uh, still a lot of interesting questions to be answered. And these are things that you and other paleontologists are looking into. That's right. So there's a lot to be done yet. Thank you, Dr. Lewis. Thank you. Dr. Weems is also with the U.S. Geological Survey, and he joins us now. Uh, you're going to tell us about the, the evolution of the dinosaurs, how they changed over the years. Right, Lou. Uh, the dinosaurs changed continuously from the time they first appeared up until they finally all disappeared. And it's a very long, involved, and complex story, but we have a tape that will show some of the highlights and give some of the more important points of it all. So if we can roll that, uh, let's go for that.
Many people still assume incorrectly that all dinosaurs lived at the same time. It is true that they all lived within a single interval of Earth history called the Mesozoic Era. But the Mesozoic spanned an immense amount of time, from about 250 million years ago to about 65 million years ago. Dinosaurs lived during most of this time, roaming the Earth for about 160 million years. Dinosaurs changed greatly in the course of their history, so later dinosaurs looked very different from their earlier ancestors. Apatosaurus, Stegosaurus, and Allosaurus lived near the middle part of dinosaur history at a time called the Late Jurassic. Parasaurolophus, Pachycephalosaurus, Triceratops, and Tyrannosaurus lived near the end of dinosaur history at a time called the Late Cretaceous. Dinosaurs within each community fought, fled, chased, or were eaten by each other, but these communities were so far apart in time that members of one community never encountered dinosaurs from other communities. It is important to realize that the dinosaur communities illustrated here represent only two communities within dinosaur history. There are many other communities which remain poorly known or unknown. As communities of dinosaurs rose and fell, broad patterns can be discerned. Early in their history, dinosaurs split into three persistent groups. These were meat-eating theropods, such as Allosaurus, plant-eating sauropods, such as Apatosaurus, and plant-eating Ornithischians, such as Stegosaurus. A major trend in dinosaur history was the tendency for many dinosaurs to increase in size. Early dinosaurs were less than 10 feet long. By the late Jur Jurassic, 85 million years later, some had reached a length of 100 feet or more. The second major trend was the steady increase in the abundance of Ornithischian dinosaurs. In the Triassic and Jurassic, Ornithischians such as Stegosaurus tended to be overshadowed by the sauropods such as Apatosaurus. But by the late Cretaceous, Ornithischians such as Triceratops, Parasaurolophus, and Pachycephalosaurus had largely replaced the sauropods as the dominant group of plant-eating dinosaurs. Throughout the Mesozoic, meat-eating theropod dinosaurs had to become larger and smarter in order to keep up with their evolving plant-eating prey. By the end of the Mesozoic, many meat-eating dinosaurs probably were as smart as eagles or hawks are today. Dinosaur footprints look very bird-like. The similarities are not accidental. Birds and dinosaurs share a close ancestry, and some workers actually believe that birds are living dinosaurs. But others argue that dinosaurs and birds are different enough to instead be considered close cousins. If dinosaurs had feathers, there would be no argument about whether birds were dinosaurs. But so far, no dinosaur has been found with feathers. A very remarkable fossil from the late Jurassic is the skeleton of Archaeopteryx. This fossil actually includes feather impressions, which show that it was a primitive bird. But it is extremely rare to find such exquisite preservation. Usually only bones are preserved, and even then, often only a few bones somewhat jumbled about. In these cases, assigning a fossil to a bird or a dinosaur is much more difficult. Much of the argument about birds and dinosaurs is being conducted over material of this sort, and answers inevitably will be slow in coming. But whether birds are dinosaurs or dinosaur cousins, they still give us our best glimpse among living animals of what dinosaurs used to be like. And Dr. Weems, from what you've just shown us, it seems obvious that the, uh, the question about birds and dinosaurs and birds is still a rather controversial one. Oh, very much so. Um, there are a number of people who feel very strongly about it on both sides of the issue. A lot of people think scientists sit around and have very cerebral discussions, but a lot of these people have gotten really very excited and agitated about this, and I wouldn't be surprised if some of them haven't almost come to blows over it. It's amazing how interested some of these people are in this issue as to just how closely birds and dinosaurs are related. To throw you a question you may not have been prepared for, do you think that one can be resolved? I think ultimately, in the near future? Um, depends on what you mean by near future. For us, that could be the next billion years, but uh, uh, I would say probably within the next 10 or 15 years, certainly, uh, there'll probably be a fairly broad consensus on it. But right now, it's a hot topic. Dr. Williams, thank you. And you're most welcome. We also have with us Ken Wilson, who is the, an astronomer and director of the Ethel Universe Planetarium. And I know you have some theories on. Uh, extinction of the dinosaurs, and I see you have some show and tell. Yes, Lou, I have holding in my hands a piece of space rock, and it may well be that a cousin of this piece of space rock was responsible for the extinction of the dinosaurs, as we're about to see. Many theories have been proposed over the years to explain the mysterious extinction of the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. 
One of the most interesting new theories that's come along in recent years involves a disastrous change in the Earth's climate, triggered by the impact of an asteroid. Our solar system has lots of debris left over from its formation some five billion years ago. Most of this material is wrapped up in comets and asteroids. Comets can best be described as giant dirty snowballs, about five to ten miles wide. When they get close to the sun, the heat from the sun changes some of the frozen gas back into gas. That gas, along with released dust, makes a cloud which flows out into space as the comet's tail. Asteroids are chunks of rock and metal, mostly found between Mars and Jupiter. Some of them are more than a hundred miles wide. Most are smaller, the size of pebbles to boulders. Small bits of space rock fall to the Earth all the time. Most of them burn up in the atmosphere as meteors. Once in a while, the space rock will be large enough that it doesn't completely burn up. If large enough, an asteroid can hit the Earth so hard that it will literally explode. In the 1970s, a team of scientists at the University of California proposed that an asteroid at least six miles wide struck the Earth 65 million years ago and exploded. The force of the explosion is estimated to have been equal to five billion Hiroshima-sized atom bombs. This explosion blasted 100 trillion tons of dust high into the Earth's atmosphere. The jet stream spread the dust around the world. This dust could have triggered worldwide acid rains, which would have killed much of the Earth's plant life. This dust would also reduce the amount of sunlight reaching the surface of our planet. The reduced sunlight could have killed off many of the plants that the plant-eating dinosaurs depended on for food. Without food, the vegetarian dinosaurs starved and became extinct. Without them, the meat-eating dinosaurs wouldn't have anything left to eat either, so they too became extinct. Evidence for this theory comes from the geologic layers formed 65 million years ago. Scientists have found a thin layer of the element iridium at just about where the last dinosaur fossils are found. Iridium is not very common on the surface of the Earth. Asteroids, on the other hand, contain a lot of iridium. So if a giant asteroid did hit the Earth and explode 65 million years ago, we would expect to find a lot of iridium in the fallout of dust. And this is just what has been found. A similar impact on a smaller scale occurred over 20,000 years ago in northern Arizona. A small asteroid, several hundred feet across, slammed into the Earth and exploded with the force of a 20 megaton nuclear bomb. It blasted out a crater almost one mile across. It's called Meteor Crater, and you can visit it if you ever travel through northern Arizona. This meteorite, on loan from Phil Roberts, is a fragment left over from the impact of the asteroid that made Meteor Crater. Ken, with all those theories, is there a complete agreement on that asteroid theory of extinction? No, there's still a lot of debate going on. Uh, many paleontologists feel that there are other explanations, and uh, the evidence is still not all in on this subject. Is it coming in? Is, are we continuing to get evidence from time to time? Yeah, in fact, recently they found the remains of an old crater of about the right age. Uh, previously, we had not found any craters of that age that could have been from that impact, and just recently they found one under the uh, Gulf of Mexico and part of the Yucatan Peninsula. Certainly the extinction of the dinosaurs is as fascinating as the lives of the dinosaurs. Ken, thank you. Ken Wilson. Joanne Mulvaney is a science teacher at Godwin High School in Henrico County, and I know you have been uh, working with many of the fossils that are found right here in Virginia. And what, what can you learn from some of these fossils and making casts of them? Uh, Lou, I think that one of the things that this shows our students today is that science is not a body of facts to be learned and memorized. Uh, I think it shows our students that this is the way that new ideas come about. One of the things we deal with in our classroom is the uh, inquisitive, curious student who is often going to precede questions with, this is a stupid question, I'm afraid to ask it. And so I think what we're seeing here this morning is that scientists too have questions and that they don't have all the answers to these questions, but what they have is a process that allows them to discover new information and they gather their data, they have respect for their data, they want 
data accuracy and they have ways of getting with other scientists, collaborating, sharing that information. Uh, when we look at the way we're teaching science today, this process allows us to teach students what we consider scientific values and attitudes. Uh, the research shows us that the basic information, the facts that we teach our students is a rather short-lived type of memory. But it's the processes, the critical thinking, these values and attitudes that will carry them into the next century. In mathematics, we ha it's a very exact science. We know what the sum of two and five would be. But uh, in something of, like studying the dinosaurs, we don't have exact answers. Are the students impatient that you can't say yes or no? I don't think so. I think, if anything, it allows them to use their curiosity, to use their imagination. And that's one of the things that has impressed me about the students I've worked with over the years. They are very curious. They have excellent questions. Uh, this is a good opportunity for them to get some information from the experts who are actually working in the field and to see how these scientists really do science. That's not something that the answers are all there in their book. Uh, it really opens up the creative world of science for them. We have a number of students from Godwin High School here. Uh, again, this is in my backyard, uh, about three blocks from Godwin. I hear all the uh, football games. Uh, and we have some questions. Uh, who would like to ask a question of our scientists? Hi, Hi. what's your name? My name is Carlos Munoz. Carlos? My question is directed to Mr. Wilson. I was wondering if you have any idea geologically where the meteor might have struck the Earth? Did you hear the question where the, uh, geologically where the meteor may have struck the Earth? Well, there, there are two craters that have been found that are about the right age, 65 million years old. One of them is in Manson, Iowa, and the other one is in the uh, Gulf of Mexico, overlapping into the Yucatan Peninsula. Those are the two most likely craters they've found so far. There may be others, too. I'd like to remind our viewers uh, also that if you have a, uh, a telephone, you're welcome to call in. We'll take a few more questions from our folks at uh, Godwin High School here. Who would like to ask a question? Yes. I'm Rick Schwartz, and it's the right. Dr. Ludwig. How do scientists determine the uh, weight of um, a vertebrate in dinosaurs? Okay. How did the, uh, you might want to answer this, how, the, how did the scientists determine the weight of a vertebrae in dinosaurs? The weight of a vertebrae? Uh, when you look at the density of bone for modern animals, and then you calculate the mass of the thing, and then you can tell, estimate an age, a weight from that. Um, so you're looking at, uh, Modern reptiles, and probably best calculations would come from that. Uh, a lot of the smallest dinosaurs were not very large, and uh, one, the vertebrae also were not very large. You get something the size of Tyrannosaurus, and you need a very complex architecture to hold up all of that muscle and, and skin and teeth. Another question? Uh Hi, I'm Carrie. Could you elaborate on how you decide what color the skin of the dinosaur is? That's a great question. Our question is, uh, can we elaborate on how we decide what color the skin is? Would any of you? <laughs> everybody's taking a step back for, for Dr. Weems. Okay. Well, uh, the color of the skin of dinosaurs is really one of the hardest and most intractable problems because it's very rare to even get an impression of the skin left at all. And when you do, you can get some idea of the scale patterning, but you don't have anything that's left of the original color. So the only way we can tackle the problem is by making analogies with living animals. In other words, what do other large living animals have for color patterns? But then again, you have to start making some assumptions about what the lifestyles were like. Animals that are fairly small and hide uh, want to be camouflaged, so they tend to go in for fairly dull browns or greens if they're in a greener area. On the other hand, um, animals that are fairly vicious or have uh, poison or some kind of sharp claws or something that will um, allow them to keep up with the competition could have been very brightly colored because they wouldn't have to worry about hiding or anything like that. But it's, it's all inferential. We don't really have any direct way to get to that problem. Well, Dr. Weems, we're not only making some inferences about how they live, we're making some inferences about what the territory looked like at that time. Yes, and, and that perception has changed greatly. Um, back at the time when the old movie The Lost World was made, you know, dinosaurs were generally viewed as being things living in big green jungles. Uh, now a lot of the earlier and middle dinosaurs are considered to be more like animals living in savanna environments, things that are more open. 
and drier, probably more brown than green. So um, a lot depends on your assumptions. And in terms of vegetation and climate, there are ways to get at that. that that's work that's ongoing in the next 20, 30 years will probably affect a fairly nice revolution in that. But then all the rest of it still, still is very inferential. Excellent questions so far. Do you have some more? Who would like to raise a hand? Yes. This is to Dr. Weems. It's, I very much like the theory that dinosaurs may have evolved into birds, but as far as them having wings and the feathers, how would they have, how would, do you have any idea how the feathers could have evolved from the dry skin they had? Okay, well, there are some clues in the uh, embryology of um, birds. As a bird develops in the shell, uh, you can see that the uh, nucleus of the feather forms under an old, what's essentially a reptilian scale and will grow out from under it and then spread out into the uh, wing form. So they are derived from the same basic embryological tissues as scales, but of course they're much more elaborate. Uh, we don't, as I mentioned in the tape, have any evidence of um, dinosaurs having any uh, feathers. And uh, we do have here a diagram of the evolutionary pattern of these animals. Uh, Dave? Yeah. If we can look at that, is that on the screen yet? Or Okay. Uh, you can see that in terms of the way these animals are, are normally portrayed, birds are the only things that uh, show feathers of the animals that we've got here. Some of the smaller theropods, uh, there have been arguments made that maybe they were feathered, but there's no direct evidence of it at this point. And that really is a critical issue. Are, are feathers something that are strictly a bird feature? or did some of the dinosaurs that uh, may have been most closely related to birds have feathers? Because if they had feathers, that would make them much more obviously closely related. I don't want to give the impression I haven't been listening to all of you folks this morning, all of you scientists, but we see pictures of some of the dinosaurs flying. Is that not so? Okay, the, the things that um, people see that are of that sort are a group called pterosaurs or pterodactyls. And they actually, I did not put them in that diagram, but they are also closely related to birds and dinosaurs. But they're not dinosaurs. But they're not truly true dinosaurs. dinosaurs. And I think everyone at this point would agree that they're not truly dinosaurs. But they are flying reptiles that are very closely related to them. And they lived in that uh, time period? Yeah, the, the earliest um, pterodactyls appear about the same time that the first abundant dinosaurs come in, which is in about the middle of the Upper Triassic. And they made it all the way to the end of the Cretaceous, so um, almost complete out overlap in time. Joanne, do you have a question too? Um, I would like to ask Dr. Wilson if he would elaborate on some of the other theories as to the ex possible extinction of the dinosaur. The asteroid and the impact of the asteroid is the one that we hear the most about. What are some of the other theories that have been on the table? Well, I might pass this to our, my other colleagues up here, but uh, I'm most informed about the, um, the cosmic uh, version. Uh, but I know there are other theories that involve volcanic activity. Um, there are several geologists I know that uh, propose that uh, there was a lot of volcanic activity, and there's some evidence that there was a lot of volcanic activity at the uh, end of the Cretaceous period. And uh, the iridium element that I mentioned in the tape piece uh, could also come from the interior of the Earth and that volcanic activity. And that seems to be one of the major contending theories, although I know there are other evolutionary theories that the dinosaurs didn't necessarily die off so quickly, but perhaps uh, some other members of the panel up here can address those questions. Uh, yeah. Do you have a way to distinguish the iridium from volcanic activity versus the iridium from your asteroid? Is there a way to distinguish the difference? Uh, not that I'm aware of. The iridium element is basically the same iridium element. It would come either from the interior of the Earth or from asteroids. The question that uh, Joanne Mulvaney had was other extinction theories other than the uh, astronomical ones of a, a meteorite uh, or a meteor crater. Uh, would you have any uh, thoughts on that? Well, one of the points that might be made is that uh, the debate frequently focuses on just one cause. Uh, perhaps there were multiple causes. One of the things to keep in mind is not all the dinosaurs lived at the same time. They, to say that all dinosaurs lived at the same time would be like saying that Columbus and Michelangelo and uh, George Bush all lived at the same time. Yes, we're all people, uh, but no, they did not live all at the same time. Um, all, likewise, all the dinosaurs covered a span of 150 million years of Earth history. 
Uh, some of them died out long before others died out. And by the, by the end of the Cretaceous, the diversity of the dinosaurs has, had declined already uh, quite drastically. So you're, if you look at the entire diversity of dinosaurs, uh, they'd already begun uh, branches of the dinosaur line already had died out long before the end of the Cretaceous. The question might be why? So what the caused? question would be why. It could perhaps be a change in environment, change in climate, change in food source. Part people have postulated that it might be related to disease. Uh, there are a number of things. Certainly an asteroid impact at that point looks very likely. It was probably the coup de grace, it was probably the final blow, but I'm not, it was the last insult, but I'm not sure it was the first or only insult to their existence. Do we have any more questions? For, yes. Um, I was just curious, you know, people have been talking about um, how dinosaurs became extinct, but how did they first appear on Earth? You know, I mean, what did they evolve from if they did? The question was, uh, we were debating how they became extinct. What we'd like to know is where did they come from? How did they first appear? Okay, um, well, the fossil record on that point is still fairly poor. Uh, the very earliest uh, thing that is sort of a borderline between a dinosaur and a pre-dinosaur comes from um, up very early Upper Triassic rocks in South America. And uh, it, it's close enough to the borderline that there's a lot of argument back and forth at the present time as to whether it's quite gotten there or not gotten there. And part of the problem is, you know, how do you even set up the ground rules for a question like that? What makes a dinosaur? Uh, you don't really think about it till you find something that doesn't have all of the accoutrements and then you start realizing that something hadn't quite gotten there. But in general, um, dinosaurs evolved out of a group of reptiles called thicodonts. And uh, these animals were the common ancestors of dinosaurs, birds, pterosaurs, and also crocodiles. And probably, uh, judging from the bits and pieces that have been found, the story goes back maybe all the way into the early Triassic, maybe some 30 million years before what we have good records of. But apparently towards the, um, the end of the Triassic, the, the line that finally ended up becoming dinosaurs apparently started to change very rapidly, evolve very quickly. And uh, probably after a fairly slow start, they did a rather rapid um, explosion into the various types of dinosaurs that uh, we're familiar with. I have the smile on my face. And uh, as I'm hearing Dr. Weems speak about where the dinosaurs may have come from, I'm wondering why we are having trouble in 1992 explaining what has evolved from the dinosaurs, and there's no big consensus yet, from what you had yeah. said earlier. Well, of course, you know, some people claim birds are, are direct descendants of dinosaurs. Others contend they're cousins and all the dinosaurs died out. Um, there still actually is a fair amount of controversy over whether all the dinosaurs did die out at the end of the Cretaceous. Um, there are dinosaur bones and teeth that do get found in somewhat younger rocks. But there's a major controversy over whether these things are, are simply, at that time, were fossils that were being washed out and redeposited into younger, younger rocks, or whether they possibly could uh, represent animals that had survived the, the big explosion of the impact. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of people, again, are, are very hot on these topics, and sometimes the arguments aren't all that rational. Now, I, I, we have some great students with great questions here at Godwin High School, but I don't want to leave you out as well. If you have a telephone, you're welcome to call that number that you see on the screen and ask our panel, Dr. Litwin or Dr. Weems, Ken Wilson, the astronomer, uh, even Joanne Mulvaney, who has been uh, working on this for a long time, or we'll call them all in to answer your questions if you just call the number that you see on your screen. And uh, we'll ha they'll be able to hear you, and you'll be able to hear their answer as well. So if you have a question, based on what you've heard and what you've seen so far this hour, please feel free to call in and do that now. Uh, we'll put you in line and to get on, on the air and to talk about this. Other questions? I have one. You have a question? Yes. Hi, my name is Allison Jones, and my question is, I was wondering if y'all are familiar with the land bridge theory, and if so, maybe could you give a geographical location and also express your thoughts on this theory? Uh, I presume that there, there are a number of land bridge theories that have come up over the years. I presume the one you're talking about is Backer's recent uh, idea that uh, land bridges between the continents in the later part of the Mesozoic may have induced extinctions. Um, certainly in the age of mammals, something like that occurred when um, the Isthmus of Panama came up above the sea. 
through much of um, the more recent geologic past, South America was like Australia. It was a island, and it was separated from North America, and only a few things like bats or some apparently rodents that floated across in logs, perhaps, made it to South America. But for the most part, the animals there evolved in isolation. And then long about um, maybe as much as four or five million years ago, the Isthmus of Panama started to rise up out of the ocean because of the plate motions. And that allowed a land bridge to develop, which caused, which, which allowed actually animals to migrate both ways. Some came from South America to North America, uh, like the giant ground sloths and the possum. The possum is an animal that came originally from South America. Um, more often, though, the animals came from North America to South America. And the end result of it all was that most of the, or a great many of the South American mammals died out and were replaced by North American animals which moved into the area. And this idea has been proposed as a possibility for at least continent-wide extinctions in the Mesozoic, that um, perhaps a land bridge opened up from one continent to another, and the dinosaurs on one continent were essentially invaded by dinosaurs from another. And there is some evidence of at least something like that happening in the late Cretaceous. The um, animals like Apatosaurus, the large sauropods, um, so far as anybody knows, apparently disappeared in North America around the middle of the Cretaceous. But then in the upper Cretaceous, they reappeared. And the ones that reappear are very similar to ones that were evolving in South America. So it looks like perhaps that same scene played itself out, that a land bridge opened from South America to North America, and there was movement back and forth. But the jury's still out on how much extinction was involved. Um, it's certainly an interesting idea, and, in, and as I said, in the recent geologic past, it's worked. The jury is still so out. The jury's out. We have a call from Becky from Bird Middle School. Becky? Sutton. I'm a sixth grader at William Byrd Middle School in Benton, Virginia. And my question is, in what part of Virginia do you think dinosaurs ranked? In what part of Virginia? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, in terms of where they were, um, for much of the time they were probably all over the state. I mean, just like now, um, there may or may not be anything left of the city of Richmond in 60 or 70 million years. Uh, just because we don't find their bones doesn't mean they weren't there. It may just means that there may not be any sediments left of the right age. So um, partly it's, it's not a fair question in the sense that a lot of areas in Virginia probably had dinosaurs that now don't have any sediments to preserve the bones. Part of the time there weren't any in the eastern part because the ocean probably came in about halfway up from Virginia Beach to about Richmond, maybe at some times in the Upper Cretaceous, and that would have precluded that. But otherwise, they probably arranged over the whole state, and the fossils actually occur in a number of places. Um, there are structural basins or all filled in valleys, essentially, which occur in a number of places, like uh, from Leesburg down to Culpeper, around Barbersville, Scottsville, uh, Farmville, uh, Danville area. And also Richmond up to Ashland, there were some basins that have um, sediments. Mm -hmm. Not all of them have yielded dinosaur bones, but most have yielded footprints at this point. And there are also later Cretaceous sediments that occur along the fall line from Washington, D.C. and Alexandria, all the way down through Fredericksburg and down to Petersburg. <laughs> Excuse me. And uh, in Maryland, these sediments have yielded dinosaur bones. So far, none in Maryland, in Virginia. But uh, the likelihood is eventually they'll show up. Now we go live to Norfolk and to Melissa. Melissa, what is your question? Hi, this is Melissa Kelm, and I'm in the seventh grade at Northside Middle. And my question is, how many babies are in a litter or whatever they have? Let me take uh, Ron Litwin and, and uh, answer that. Dr. Litwin, uh, how many babies? And that's a very good question. Um, some of the nests that have been found in Mongolia of some Cretaceous dinosaurs have numbered up to several dozen eggs within one nest. Uh, I'm not familiar with the most uh, recent estimates. Um, there have been a number of dinosaur nests that have been uncovered from Cretaceous uh, dinosaurs up in Mon Montana from the work of Jack Horner, who's working up there. Um, he has been the one that has uh, brought in the idea of dinosaur parenting that it became in vogue in the last couple of years. Um, Literally as, as recently as the last two years? Well, we're talking about the last five to ten years. It is certainly. relatively recent theory. Yeah, it's relatively recent theory. Uh, but again, probably uh, dinosaurs laid up to uh, a dozen and a half. 
eggs or no, no more than several dozen within a, a, a particular nest. Part of it depends on strategy, just like birds today. Some birds lay their eggs, sit on the chicks, and then the chicks are gone, very little parenting is involved. If that's the case, they can afford to lay more eggs because the birds are on their own as soon as they hatch. Other uh, birds lay eggs and take care of their young for a long time. They have to lay fewer eggs because it involves more effort on their part to feed them and raise them. So the number varied. Thank you, Dr. Litwin. We go to Falls Church and to Summer. What is your question? Hello, my name is Summer McDonald. I'm in sixth grade at Grand Road Elementary, and I want to know what species do the dinosaurs originate from? Did, could you repeat that question, please? What species? What species did the dinosaurs originate from? We tried to answer that slightly, but maybe didn't do a very good job. I'm going to throw that to Dr. Weems. Uh, what species did the dinosaurs evolve from? Well, as I, I mentioned earlier, they evolved from a group called the Thecodonts, but um, the specific species involved in the transition from Thecodonts to dinosaurs remain either undiscovered or so fragmentary that uh, we don't really know what we have yet. Um, the, the critical changeover, as I said, was around the change from the middle to the late Triassic. And that's an interval that uh, has not been all that well studied at this point. There, the, the rocks of that age don't exist, for instance, in this part of the world. Uh, much of the northern hemisphere, um, the lands were going uh, erosion at that point. And again, as I said, they probably were here, but we don't have any record. Most of the deposits of the right general age are from parts of South America and South Africa. And although there's been a fair attempt to study them and a fair number of animals have been described, the other problem we've got is that most of the sediments from that time period seem to represent fairly low swampland environments. Mm -hmm. And dinosaurs were probably evolving in more upland environments. So we've got a uh, problem with the fossil record at that point. Um, nobody has yet either found a dinosaur that wandered down into the swampy areas and got bogged down, or some deposits of more upland areas of that particular age. So that still remains something of a hole in the record. We have Linda calling from D.C., but before we do that, is it possible to uh, get Dr. Callison on the line once again? I understand he is on the line. No? OK. Oh, OK. Linda will go direct to uh, Linda from uh, D.C. Linda, what is your question? and I would like to know what is meant by Mesoric era and how did the term come about? The various eras of, uh, of geologic time is what we're talking about, if I heard the question correctly. Which one of you would like to take that? The, the Mesozoic era, but all the other eras of time. Um, when uh, scientists were first starting to dig up fossils in the rocks, they had to figure out some way of assigning them different ages or relative ages. And so they divided Earth history up into four eras or four major divisions of time, the Paleozoic, the Mesozoic, the Cenozoic, and then uh, the, the Paleozoic, uh, or the Mesozoic rather, is made up of the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous. And then the Tertiary, and then the Quaternary, which was up to the recent time. Um, so these are larger subdivisions of time that may take in as much as uh, perhaps 50 million years. Um, these are the greater subdivisions. We can subdivide it more finely than that within several million years, uh, but the terms that we're still dealing with today for Mesozoic era, in fact, are, are uh, things that scientists have named uh, 150 or more years ago. So. Um, our terminology and the way that we subdivide time more finely now has improved, but we still keep a lot of the terminology that was originally in use. Well, Dr. Litwin, I don't mean to be funny about this, but when we're talking, I can't remember things that yeah. may have happened 30 years ago, right. much less what happened 50 million, but what kind of numbers are we talking about here when you're talking about the various when epochs you, and eras? And When you go back to uh, the beginning of um, shelled animals, uh, things like uh, when the first fossil shellfish, uh, clams, brachiopods, that sort of thing, snails, they go back 600 million years. Right. When we get into land animals, we're talking about something on the order of 350 million years before present. And the extinction of the dinosaur, the earliest dinosaurs, as one example, would be somewhere in the order of 215 million years before present. 
the oldest dinosaurs, the last of the dinosaurs, like Tyrannosaurus, approximately 60 or 65 million years before now. Or to put it, give you a different analogy, Lou, if you take people and look at the, and put them on a timeline, the distance that they're separated from Tyrannosaurus rex is less than the distance between Tyrannosaurus rex and the first dinosaurs. As a matter of fact, the first dinosaurs are twice as far away on a timeline from Tyrannosaurus as we are. So there's a considerable amount of time to divide up, to slice and dice as, as we choose. We go to uh, DC and to Aaron. Planet, Did you hear the question? I'm going to ask you to repeat the question, please. If an asteroid hits the planet, why are fossils intact? If an asteroid hit the planet, Ken, I think this is this is yours. Uh, question. I think the question was, if an asteroid hit the planet, why are the fossils intact? Is that yes. the question? Well, the asteroid impact would only have generated a, a major concussion at the site of the impact. The, uh, the damage was an ecological damage, not so much the shock damage. Uh, what happens is that when a major asteroid hits the Earth, there's a big explosion at that impact site. That kicks a lot of dust up into the atmosphere, and the dust cuts off the sunlight, which uh, the plants need, and without plants to eat on the vegetarian dinosaurs die off and then the meat eaters. So there's not that much of a concussion that would necessarily shatter the bones of the dinosaurs. So it wouldn't really affect that many fossils except right at the impact site itself. It's a environmental catastrophe rather than an explosive catastrophe all around the world. This is not a question that, uh, that deals specifically with what Aaron asked, but if a, uh, a big asteroid hits the Earth, it can it be big enough to hurt the Earth, to knock it out of orbit. Well, yes, uh, we certainly see elsewhere in the solar system evidence where major impacts have shattered smaller bodies in the solar system. In fact, our own moon was almost shattered uh, uh, several billion years ago when a major impact there created a very large crater. Mm -hmm. All right, we have a question on, uh, on the line from Iris. Iris, uh, go right ahead. How did um, meat eaters catch their food? How did the meat eaters catch their food? Uh, let me throw this one at you. Okay. Well, that, the strategy varied according to the dinosaur. Um, there's, like many things, a lot of controversy over these issues. Uh, some of them uh, have very long legs and are quite um, built rather like a cheetah or a gazelle. And these animals pretty clearly could have uh, run down food. Although most of the ones that are built like that are fairly small dinosaurs, they would have probably either caught things the size of birds or small mammals or, or lizards. Uh, the larger ones like Allosaurus, for instance, um, they're still fairly agile, and they probably were capable of um, getting a pretty good head of steam up once they got rolling. Um, animals like Tyrannosaurus, uh, that's one that's very controversial. Well, look at its uh, front legs. They're very short. Yeah, um, obviously they didn't run on the front legs. Uh, well, what about even getting the food to their mouth? Uh, in the case of Tyrannosaurus, that uh, probably was not an option. Uh, most of the other animals probably did at least have uh, some ability to get the food to the mouth. In the case of Tyrannosaurus, um, the best they might have done would have been to have levered something up a bit or turned it over. Mm -hmm. But obviously, they must have used their mouths almost entirely for the, um, the actual processing of the food. But Tyrannosaurus, um, that's an animal that um, there are two very different schools of thought. Some people consider the bone structure to be insufficient to do more than maybe give a good shuffle. Mm -hmm. Others argue that uh, the animal probably was capable of speeds maybe up to like 45 miles an hour. And that's, again, one of these other controversies that's being worked on. All right. We go to uh, Tidewater, Virginia, Norfolk, and Latrice. Um, hi, my name is Latrice McCoy, I'm outside Metazone Extension in Sarasota. My question is, do you have any idea what the average lifespan of a dinosaur is? The average lifespan of a dinosaur. Which one of you would like to, to take that? How long did a dinosaur live? Um, first of all, being a dinosaur is probably a hard way to make a living, so most of them probably didn't live out their full natural life. Mm -hmm. Most of them died either f uh, by injury, accident, or uh, ended up being lunch or breakfast. Um, many of them, though, probably had a lifespan like the large sauropods. It take a long time to grow to be that size. 
So some of them probably had a lifespan uh, somewhat similar to the large tortoises today, which are the oldest reptiles that we know of, which could be several hundred years. So they, some of them probably got to be as much as several hundred years old. Would you say at the other end of the scale there might have been some that didn't live very many years at all as, right. a, as some, a natural lifespan, not because they were eaten? Right. Probably as a uh, natural lifespan, some of them probably only had uh, lived long enough for them to grow to maturity, uh, nest, raise young, or, or uh, lay eggs and then probably died shortly thereafter. So some of them, the lifespans probably range from several years up to several hundred years. Um, and again, you, could, you couldn't grow something as large as a Tyrannosaurus or as an Apatosaurus or Brachiosaurus in, in several years. A few moments ago we were talking about the different geological eras. Would a dinosaur live longer in one geological era than an a dinosaur might live in another geological area, a different uh, dinosaur. That's a very good question. I don't know that uh, we really have a good handle on that yet as far as strategies. Um, some of them may certainly, have, I would say that probably something on the order of um, 50 years was a very good lifespan for a dinosaur. And I would be surprised if most of them, if you look at all the species that are known, if most of them, if, or if many of them surpassed 50 years. So something along the uh, the lifespan or just shorter than the lifespan of a human probably would be reasonable. Now a friend here standing right next to us, a rather large dinosaur. He's what, 40 feet uh, at least right. from tail to snout? Right. Uh, that would take a while to grow. That's right. It'd take a long time to grow and it would take a lot to feed him to get him that size. So he, he shortened the lifespan of a lot of other dinosaurs while he was growing. So he probably lived to be uh, perhaps as much as 100 or more years old. Uh, so you're looking at a very large, very successful beast. You gentlemen are scientists. You deal with uh, uh, dinosaurs. You deal with geology, paleontology. Uh, do you still find it uh, more fascinating than merely a scientific pursuit? I think if we lost the gee whiz and the, uh, the wow part of it, then we would uh, go into something, another line of work. I think that the, the thing that is most fascinating is the discovery. All right, from uh, Richmond, we have John L. Is it possible for the Loch Ness Monster to be a descendant of a dinosaur that lived many years ago? That's a good question. Uh, if I don't know uh, if they've ever discovered that the Loch Ness Monster exists, but were it to exist, could it have been a could it be a dinosaur? Uh, very unlikely. Um, there are a couple reasons for that. Uh, one is that, so far as we know. Um, the dinosaurs tended to live in a rather warmer climate than anything that exists today. And Loch Ness is way up, you know, it's um, in the far north end of Scotland. It's a very bleak, cold, dreary sort of place. Uh, the second reason, as Dr. Litwin mentioned earlier, is that there's no indication that dinosaurs ever evolved into seagoing animals or, or even um, totally aquatic animals of, of a crocodile sort. And the third problem is that up until 10,000 years ago, Loch Ness was under the ice of the last glacial period, or maybe 12 or 15, but within, within that range. So that the, uh, the lake didn't exist in the form that it exists now. So the Loch Ness Monster, if it exists at all, would have had to have come in there from somewhere else. I think most people who are willing to entertain the notion that it exists at all, and some people don't even do that, are much more inclined to think that it would probably be some kind of very large fish or something something descended from an animal that survived much closer to the present time, maybe a large eel or something like that. Well, as you correctly point out, England or, or Scotland uh, has undergone some vast climatic changes, but mm -hmm. so has most of the world. It's not yes. as we know it today in the 1990s. Mm -mm. Uh, we have uh, the part that is today the Grand Canyon has been underwater seven separate times. Right. So the earth has changed from desert to lush greenery. So I'm wondering again about England or Scotland, that area of the world certainly must have changed a lot. Yeah, it, it's changed so much that um, it's nothing at all like what anything any dinosaur is known to have ever lived in. Um, the other aspect of that is that um, the, the various changes that have occurred throughout the world, an animal the size of a dinosaur needs a fairly stable environment. It needs a lot of room to move around in. And by the time you got up towards the Ice Age, when the climate started shifting and the climate belt started shifting around very drastically, and you started getting fairly small climates within climates, 
uh, these sorts of environments um, aren't conducive to really large animals. They, you, smaller animals can make do with a smaller space. So even if the dinosaurs hadn't died out when they did, it's rather unlikely that any really big ones would have made it up, say, through the Ice Age, because um, it, the conditions would have just been too drastically different. Small ones, that might have been a different matter. We have, uh, from Fort Monroe, we have Heather. What is your yes, question? I was wondering whether or not you read Jurassic Park, and if you think that's an accurate description of dinosaurs and their behavior. Can you to repeat that, please, so we can, uh, we can hear that. Yes, I read Jurassic Park recently, and I was wondering if you thought it was an actual interpretation of dinosaurs and their behaviors at the time period. Um, there were uh, parts of the book for uh, Jurassic Park um, that would be pretty reasonable. I'm sure that the dinosaurs were fairly diverse as they depicted them in the, in the novel. Uh, one of the things to note is that when they did clone the dinosaurs, um, that they cloned ones of various ages. So they put dinosaurs together in Jurassic Park um, that were not only Jurassic. Uh, but they brought together a, an assemblage of animals that lived at different times. So, the, insofar as I probably didn't represent a natural community, no, it wasn't accurate. But as far as were some of the dinosaurs perhaps poisonous, that could be true. Uh, were some of the dinosaurs capable of swimming, that again could be true, although they were not aquatic. They probably could have swum enough to get across a stream or a river. Um, so parts of it were fairly accurate, yes. All right. Uh, let me ask a question of our, our Godwin students here, too. Do, do you have any questions for our scientists just be, before we leave? Yes. Um, I'd like to know the scientists' opinion on the uh, Proto-Avis finding and its validity. The Proto-Avis finding and its validity? Um, sorry, this is the beginning part. But is the Proto-Avis is it valid? Yes. Uh, yeah, that, that's one of the really most controversial issues going on right at the moment. Um, I suppose I should say right up front that the man who described Proto-Avis, uh, Shankar Chatterjee, is an old and very dear friend of mine. So um, I can't be perhaps entirely uh, viewed as a non-biased observer in this. But uh, he did bring the specimen to the Smithsonian a few years back, and I got a chance to look at it. And I was very impressed with uh, a lot of the avian qualities about it. The uh, back of the brain case is swollen out which um, is something that you normally see only in birds and primates because when you live up in trees you have to have a good sense of balance and that's the cerebellum that's enlarging. Some of the joints in the uh, limbs seem very bird-like. But there are some problems. Um, one problem is that Proto-Avis comes from so far back in the dinosaur bird story that it's entirely possible at that point that there were some branches living that may represent things that we don't even know yet. Um, in other words, it could literally be something that was in between being a dinosaur and being a bird that, that represents a group that at the present time we don't even have a place to put it. But um, I, uh, I think the evidence is certainly very um, suggestive. But the problem, of course, that's faced with the specimen is that it was found in a flood deposit where a bunch of animals were washed into the bend of a river and jumbled in together. So there are several different problems. One is that the material has been rather badly crushed. The other is that it's been at least slightly jumbled around. And the third problem is that the uh, nature of the uh, preservation in that deposit is such that there's no likely hope of getting a feather impression even if the animal had feathers. If the thing had feathers, that would settle it right there. But um, it doesn't seem likely at this point that it's going to be possible to get them. Uh, Dr. Chatterjee is back digging in, in that same quarry and in a couple other areas where he's found some more remains of this animal and hopefully better material will show up which will um, settle the issue better. But uh, I, I have a great deal of respect both for Dr. Chatterjee and I think the material looks very interesting. Great. I think it's certainly, it, it's not a cut and dried issue, but I think it's a very viable theory. We go to Bev Wright. What is your question? Hello. Hi, my name is Beth Wright. I'm in the sixth grade at William Burr Middle School in Denton. When fossil finds are made, who decides who gets to keep them? <laughs> the family dog. Uh, who decides who gets to keep the, the fossil well, remains? Which one of you would like to take that? Let me, let me move over here. Um, when a scientist studies a fossil, what we um, 
usually do is to put it reposited or deposited in a museum so that it can be after it's been described so that it can be studied by others to uh, to check our accuracy and to check the uh, the details in the fossil um, so most of the fossils that are found especially if they're found from people who work for public organizations go into public museums uh, fossil collecting is permitted um, by private individuals with certain restrictions on certain lands, including federal and public lands, um, but that varies from state to state. There are a number of state parks that allow you to collect fossils, for example, for yourself or for schools, um, educational institutions, but uh, many of them end up in museums where they can be available for study by scientists later in time. I'd like to thank everybody involved here, uh, certainly uh, Dr. Litwin, thank you. Dr. Weems, Ken Wilson of the uh, Science Museum and the uh, Ethel Universe Planetarium, our uh, students from uh, Godwin High School and Joanne Mulvaney, uh, and also uh, Dr. George Callison, who s you saw at the very beginning telling you about the Dynamation, the folks who put together uh, my friend behind me here, the big Tyrannosaurus Rex, Dynamation International. And to all the students watching us who participated and called in with their questions. We'd also like to thank the Virginia Department of Education, which provided major funding for this broadcast. I'd also like to remind you that the dinosaurs, which have been on display at the Science Museum of Virginia, leave on Sunday. No, not under their own power, but they will leave on Sunday. So visit us anytime between now and Sunday to see the dinosaur displays at the Science Museum of Virginia. <laughs>